In this video, we will discuss the typical anatomy of the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus supplies motor innervation to muscles of the shoulder, arm, forearm, and hand. The brachial plexus also provides sensory innervation to the bones, skin, muscles, and connective tissue of the shoulder and upper extremity. Let's begin by defining what a nerve plexus is. A nerve plexus is formed when nerve fibers from two or more spinal segments intermingle and then segregate in order to travel together to a common anatomical region. For example, fibers from two or three spinal segments that are all going to the biceps brachii muscle may join together to form a single nerve bundle that travels to the biceps. Other fibers from these same spinal segments may be destined for the triceps brachii muscle, and they will join together to form a separate nerve bundle that travels to the triceps. Specifically, the brachial plexus contains motor and sensory fibers from spinal segment C5 to T1. Fibers from these spinal segments mix together and then segregate as they form first roots, then trunks, then divisions, then cords, and finally, terminal branches. Let's look at how these different parts of the brachial plexus are formed. Ventral rami from C5 to T1 form the roots. There is one root from each spinal segment and they are named according to the spinal segment they represent. For example, the C5 root. More distally, the roots form the trunks. The C5 and 6 roots join together to form the upper or superior trunk. Likewise, the C8 and T1 roots join to form the lower or inferior trunk. Finally, the C7 root continues by itself to become the middle trunk. Next, each trunk divides into an anterior division and a posterior division. This is the most important functional segregation that takes place in the brachial plexus because all of the fibers in the anterior division will innervate anterior compartment muscles, while all of the fibers in the posterior division will innervate posterior compartment muscles. Let's look at what this means. In the anatomical position, the arm can be divided by a mid-axillary line into an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment. These are also called pre-axillary and post-axillary compartments, or flexor and extensor compartments. You can now understand why the anterior and posterior divisions of the brachial plexus are formed and how they are segregated to serve different anatomical regions. Returning to the brachial plexus, we can see that the posterior divisions of each of the three trunks join together to form the posterior cord. The anterior division of the upper trunk and the anterior division of the middle trunk join together to form the lateral cord. Finally, the anterior division of the lower trunk continues by itself to form the medial cord. Note that these cords, medial, lateral, and posterior, are named according to their position relative to the axillary artery. In the anatomical position, the medial cord lies medial to the artery, the lateral cord lies lateral to the artery, and the posterior cord lies posterior to the artery. It's just a coincidence that the posterior cord is also formed by the posterior divisions of the three trunks. Finally, the brachial plexus will form its five terminal branches. These are the axillary nerve, radial nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, ulnar nerve, and median nerve. The posterior cord divides into two terminal branches, the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. The lateral cord divides into the musculocutaneous nerve and contributes to the median nerve by giving off the lateral root of the median nerve. The medial cord divides into the ulnar nerve and also contributes to the median nerve by giving the medial root of the median nerve, which joins with the lateral root of the median nerve to form the median nerve proper. The terminal branches of the lateral and medial cords form the characteristic M-shape anterior to the axillary artery, which is usually the most distinctive feature of the brachial plexus and serves as a reference point for locating and identifying the other components of the plexus. Now that we understand the major structural features of the brachial plexus, it's time to add in important smaller nerves that arise from the roots, trunks, and cords. Note that no nerves arise directly from the divisions. Two nerves arise from the roots, the dorsal scapular nerve, which is a branch of the C5 root, and the long thoracic nerve, which is formed by branches from C5, C6, and C7 roots. Two nerves also arise from the trunks. Both the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius are branches from the upper trunk. Remember, the divisions do not give rise to any nerves. 
Finally, the cords give rise to seven nerves in addition to their terminal branches. The lateral cord gives off the lateral pectoral nerve. The posterior cord gives off the upper, middle, and lower subscapular nerves. Note that the middle subscapular nerve is often called the thoracodorsal nerve. The medial cord gives off the medial pectoral nerve, the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, and the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Let's conclude by briefly discussing some clinical aspects of the brachial plexus. Because the brachial plexus innervates all of the muscles of the upper extremity, injuries to it can have devastating effects on arm and hand function that are critical for activities of daily living. The brachial plexus can be injured in many ways, of course, including penetrating knife or bullet wounds, shoulder injuries, fractures of the humerus, and surgical procedures. However, two of the most common types of injuries are upper brachial plexus injury and lower brachial plexus injury. Upper brachial plexus injury occurs during extreme or violent lateral flexion of the head, especially if the shoulder is simultaneously depressed. This is typified by a difficult delivery in which the baby's head is pulled out of the birth canal while his shoulders are trapped within the mother's pelvis. Upper brachial plexus injuries can also occur in adults when an oblique force pushes the head and shoulder in opposite directions, such as might occur during a fall from a motorcycle. Such injuries put enormous stretch on the C5 and C6 nerve roots and or the upper trunk itself. Damage to these structures results in characteristic deficits known as Herb Duchesne paralysis. In Herb Duchesne paralysis, the arm hangs limply at the side and is internally rotated. The forearm is also pronated, which slightly flexes the wrist. This produces the characteristic waiter's tip position of the arm. Lower brachial plexus injury occurs during extreme or violent abduction of the arm, such as occurs when a person falling from a ladder or tree attempts to stop himself by reaching overhead for something to hang on to. Additionally, this type of injury can also occur during delivery when a baby is pulled by the arm from the birth canal. Lower brachial plexus injury occurs from extreme stretch placed upon the C8 root, the T1 root, the lower trunk, or a combination of these. Damage to these structures compromises muscles in the forearm and hand, resulting in Klumpke's paralysis. Klumpke's paralysis is typified by claw hand, in which the fingers are flexed.